Nagakuga, secretive, silent, smooth, and supple as a piece of silk. He is an animal of darkness, and even in the dark, he travels alone. Nagakuga is an enigma, one of the most poorly known monsters in the known world, and one of the most recently discovered. The first official guild record being the adult individual slain in the Great Forest by the hero of Poke Village. Despite poor records, the species appears over much of the old world, and is confirmed as present in the new world. How does Nagakuga's ecology differ between the two continents in regards to its habitat, preferred prey, and relationships with other predators? Let's take a look. So, for many I've seen, the biggest questions surrounding Nagakuga often stem from its diet, especially in the New World where it's seemingly no longer a Kelby hunter, instead preferring big game like Aptonoth instead. How large a shift there actually is between the two continents can be split into two topics, one looking into the actual prevalence of Kelby in Nagakuga's diet and what else it could be comprised of, and two, the impacts that differing predator guilds may have on Nagakuga's behaviour and feeding ecology. So to start off, how prevalent are Kelby in the diet of Nagakuga, and what else is there for it to eat? Well, the notion of Nagakuga being a Kelby specialist is probably somewhat overblown, with this being the prey for it in the Freedom Unite and Three Ultimate cutscenes. But in Western releases of most official texts, there's no real info specifying Kelby specifically as its primary prey. Old World Nagakuga are small enough that Kelby can provide at least some worthwhile energy, and Nagakuga's seeming preference may be opportunism from them being easy to catch. It's worth noting in both instances Nagakuga surplus kills, taking multiple animals in the hunt, and this is pretty rare in the wild. Typically we see this in wild predators in rare instances where anti-predator mechanisms aren't applied for one reason or another. But in the case of Nagakuga, it's likely that Kelby are just easy to catch if you're not rumbled early on. Nagakuga may not even take them that often due to the fact that they're still comparatively small meals, even when eaten together. Kelby also typically live in small herds, but the ones Nagakuga takes in its intros appear to be in pairs. It may be possible this suggests some courtship or rutting behaviour. With such behaviours making them more vulnerable to predation, there may be a spike in Nagakuga predation in Kelby breeding periods. This fits with many large carnivores who will take advantage of small but easy seasonal meals, often surplus killing, typically in lambing or calving periods. Even with very large predators like tigers and lions, they will often still go out of their way for small, easy meals, like antelope lambs or deer fawns that they outweigh by a factor of anything between 30 to 40 times. Plus, the dense environments Nagakuga inhabits may encourage such opportunistic hunting. Dense cover doesn't just conceal predators, but prey too. And big cats like leopards can take a surprising amount of their prey by effectively stumbling across it in thick cover then catching it with superior speed, acceleration, and reflexes. In Nagakuga's daily movements through its territory that will mainly be on the ground, the same may frequently happen too, and this may also be where the wing blades come in. Whilst these may slice through vegetation in the short chases Nagakuga makes, their more important and impactful role may come through Nagakuga's daily routine. Over time, as Nagakuga patrols the forest floor, the wing blades will cut and maintain trails in the forest that other animals will inevitably use. Through creating such paths through the forest, Nagakuga stacks the deck in the probability of encountering its own prey. The reduction in cover can also aid hunting too. Whilst Nagakuga and the cats it's based on may be incredibly stealthy animals, too much cover can obscure the view of the target block the path for the lunge, or provide obstacles that may rumble your position. Cats like lions and leopards prefer to hunt in areas where the hunting is easiest, rather than areas where the prey is most abundant, and a stalking predator like Nagakuga is likely similar, but with the difference of partially creating such areas itself. Nagakuga may favour dense habitats overall, but then may create more open microhabitats in such areas to increase its odds when hunting, or just to initially encounter more prey. 
Indeed, Nagakuga may be second only to Durambaros in its impact in the deep forests of Monster Hunter, and may also readily take advantage of the open areas also created by Durambaros for its own hunting too. Not all of Nagakuga's hunting is just tripping over its own prey though, and ambush may still be frequently used. With the trails it's created or uses, Nagakuga may lie in wait for long periods like a forest leopard until something wanders into its sights, before striking. On top of this, Nagakuga may further stack the deck with diurnal activity. This increases the chances of prey encounters if you wait along the trails they use at the periods of time that they're most active, meaning Nagakuga has to burn less energy actively searching for hard-to-find low-density animals in a low-visibility environment. Nagakuga may selectively hunt certain animals at night though, and the Iceborne book mentions New World Nagakuga hunting Aptonoth nocturnally. As well as avoiding competitors, this could be due to the greater risk larger prey offer, meaning Nagakuga prefers the cover of darkness, or the cooler temperatures for a more energetically strenuous task, of both the kill and caching it afterwards. Once the kill is made, Nagakuga may not necessarily leave hunting mode, however. A prey species with equal records in Nagakuga's introductions are the small raptorial bird wyverns, and Nagakuga is seen to hunt both Velociprey and Azuchi, as well as occasional predation whilst on the move. Such bird wyverns may be vulnerable to the fatal attraction hypothesis. This is that scavenging increases risk of intraguild killing in carnivores, Essentially in that smaller carnivores are drawn to the kills of larger species, and killed when ambushed there by the original owners. Such bird wyverns are likely the most common carnivores in the world of Monster Hunter, but especially the rainforests, where their smaller size will allow them to much better utilise the animal biomass on offer than a large predatory wyvern. They in turn may provide a considerable chunk of the diet for Nagakuga, who may wait near old kills or natural carrion, and then pick off pack members including the dromes and greats themselves. This may have considerable suppression of such wyverns, and despite the danger Nagakuga pose to any community they live near, they may offer at least some services by reducing numbers of troublesome and numerous bird wyverns. Another significant prey item in the Old World may be primates. The Old World has a reasonable guild of forest primates that can all provide a fair meal for Nagakuga. Nagakuga's ability to pursue them up trees means that smaller species like Ketchawacha may struggle to effectively flee, and yet it's still large and well armed enough to predate even adult male Kongalala. If we assume such primates are mammal mammals and not wyvern mammals, then they may have undergone similar eyesight changes to our family tree, and have comparatively poor night vision in favour of good colour vision, and so may still be vulnerable to nocturnal hunts much as a leopard hunts baboons. Nagakuga's vision and hearing are by all accounts excellent, and it'll likely have the advantage over any primate in such an encounter, and so may be able to make multiple kills of small targets relatively cheaply, or to select choice individuals. Finally, a primate that occasionally crops up in Nagakuga diets is humans. With a relatively late discovery and low rate of encounter compared to other monsters, Nagakuga may not have undergone behavioural changes akin to other monsters, and view people as just another animal. Their small size and likelihood that they'll use the same jungle paths mean Nagakuga is one of the few large monsters that views humans as an actual prey item, and not a nuisance, a threat, or a rival. And as well as self-defense, one's fort may well be attempting to predate the player character. As well as nocturnal ambushes, Nagakuga may also take advantage of seasonal factors in the rainforests, and wait near fruiting trees in resource blooms. As well as primates, this would likely bring in sewers like Bullfango, and fanged beasts like Azuros, who are likely supported by fallen fruit, fungi, and invertebrates in the forest, and overall providing Nagakuga with a selection of potential targets to ambush. Such mid-sized denizens of the forest may also form a reasonable chunk of Nagakuga prey, and also include bird wyverns like Yankutku or Crimson Karepako. Indeed, in the old world at least, its habitat may mean that Nagakuga has one of the broadest diets of any large carnivorous wyvern, 
rather than specialising mainly in just big targets like Popo or Aptnoth, and occasionally supplementing their diets with small monsters. Nagakuga may still take large prey though, and may be chiefly limited in prey size by their chosen environment. Despite being productive and biodiverse habitats, dense rainforests don't support large numbers of big herbivores due to much of the plant life being toxic, or otherwise inedible. The canopy is where most of the edible stuff is found, or in occasional clearings like bys. So whilst Aptonoth are still present, they'll never reach the high densities they do in more open woodland or grassy plains. Aptonoth where present still provide important meals. And a single Aptonoth, even if only providing a single big feeding opportunity, may still give more meat than several Kelby, Velocipre or Conga. Duramboros may provide the exception here, being a very specialised animal with a specialised digestive tract for consuming wood and rainforest living. An adult Duramboros is considerably too powerful for even the largest and most ambitious Nagakuga, but with small altricial young, these may provide potential targets. Born at just six or so feet long, a baby Duramboros could well provide a potential meal throughout the first few years of its life. And with the sluggish nature of the adults, it's not impossible for a bold Nagakuga to snatch one even from the middle of a herd. It's unknown what size Duramboros become dangerous at, but they may still be potential targets even when larger than the Nagakuga. Although at this size, unless a lost or abandoned individual, the challenge comes from taking it down before the rest of the herd is attracted to the commotion. Even a juvenile Duramboros likely takes some time to kill. So we can see either way that whilst Nagakuga has a reasonably varied menu outside of just Kelby to pick from, a lot of this is still quite small prey. Smaller than its own body mass for the most part at least. And whilst much of this may be environmental, part of it may be behavioural as well. One thing about small prey is that it can be both cached easily and eaten quickly, and this can be a favourable trait in general for intaking nutrients fast. But it also means that no one else can steal it, and that you don't have to spend time hanging around a big carcass that more powerful predators may get interested in. Cheetahs can kill prey up to the size of Eland in male coalitions, but most typically prefer smaller or equal to their body mass prey, that can be taken down with relative ease and consumed swiftly. So a contributing reason for Nagakuga to take small prey may also be competition from other, and ostensibly larger, predators, muscling in to steal kills whenever it goes for larger prey. There aren't huge amounts of resident large carnivores in the deeper jungles of the old world in Monster Hunter. The most common other than Nagakuga itself are likely Rathians, who select it as a comparatively safe place to rear chicks without a Rathalos. As single mothers, they're probably not going to engage in careless fights with Nagakuga, and so likely don't have a significant impact. But one who might is Espinas. Espinas are often sluggish and sleepy, but almost certainly have very sharp senses and are a very powerful wyvern when roused. When hunting for itself, Espinas may chiefly go for abundant, low-effort prey, like amphibians and invertebrates, but it also has enormous, robust jaws that can be put to good use consuming carcasses in their entirety. It also has near-identical habitat overlap with Nagakuga, and really has a lot of tools to be a successful kleptoparasite, so Nagakuga may preferentially take smaller prey in response to Espinas and occasional jungle visitors stealing it whenever it makes a larger kill. And Espinas may be quite bear-like in its behaviour, both in this example and overall. Grizzlies have been described as just following cougars from kill to kill for a steady supply of food. And whenever possible, Espinas may engage in similar behaviour to repeatedly pirate Nagakuga's kills. This fits with Espinas's ability to locate, dominate and consume kills and its sluggish nature tendering it to the path of least resistance. It's worth noting Espinas likely doesn't display much hostility to Nagakuga outside of the initial displacement, likely being more interested in the food. So whilst once stolen there will be little left once Espinas has gone, Nagakuga may still benefit from staying in the area. As suggested earlier, Nagakuga may kill smaller carnivores attracted to its kills, 
and with such animals seemingly unconcerned with the sleepy espinas, it may still be able to recoup some energy by waiting nearby to ambush them as they approach the stolen kill. So with all this, what's the deal with the Aptonoth hunting New World Nagakuga? And to continue using cougars and similar felids as an analogy, this may be a form of competitive release when Nagakuga reached the ancient forest eons ago, and found themselves in a comparatively competitive free environment, when in a similar situation after wolf extermination, cougars ate more elk and less deer, swapping back when wolves were reintroduced in the 90s. Similarly, when free from tiger competition, leopards also ate larger and more wild prey, switching partially to more domestic animals and smaller prey when tigers recovered in the area. On top of this, the different ecology of the new world may also play a factor. Different animals play different roles in the two continents, and the toxic pukey pukey fulfills the role of the assorted primate species in the old world. Similarly, there are fewer small and medium-sized mammals like Bulfango or Azuros in the ancient forest as well, even if moss swines still persist. So another environmental prompt to a large prey like Aptonoth may also be much of the prey species Nagakuga preferred or relied on in the old world are either absent or replaced with inedible species in the new world. So despite this, for Nagakuga, the ancient ancient forest provided something of an ideal habitat, with much of the habitat it preferred but also good prey without significant competitors. And so New World Nagakuga became regular predators of large prey like Aptonoth and other herbivores, and may well have become larger as a response to this, as well as developing potentially more robust limbs and skulls to better deal with this. Depending on how long ago this happened and how much change occurred, New World Nagakuga may well have partially speciated from their Old World relatives, and may technically be a subspecies themselves. The increase in body size to facilitate large prey capture and handling may also mean that Nagakuga can no longer rely on small prey alone. Whilst they may supplement their diet with smaller animals opportunistically, Nagakuga likely just can't go back to Kelby and monkeys in the New World. For some time, Nagakuga may well have had a new world paradise effectively to themselves, where they reigned as top predator of the ancient forest with all its major needs well met. But as with many other content denizens of the ancient forest, the party was later spoiled by the Red Menace from overseas, when Rathalos colonised the area relatively recently in geological terms. And this may well have had significant impacts on the Nagakuga, like many others. As said in both Pukey and the Herbivore videos, Rathalos's arrival may well have caused large changes in the ancient forest, changing the plant structure, creating and maintaining open areas, and allowing Aptonoth and their predators to flourish, possibly at the cost of other herbivores, among other effects. Creating more open areas may initially sound like the opposite of a problem. As suggested, Nagakuga may well preferentially select for such areas to forage in, when in deep forest habitats. But in the changed new world, the different guild of predators may result in this being a far less ideal situation. Having your kills out in the open typically results in them being stolen, or your presence getting noticed. And with large prey like Aptonoth, Nagakuga may struggle to find sufficient area to cache it effectively. What's more, for large prey hunting Nagakuga, they may not have much choice but to keep using open areas. Even with the greater risk of predation from most forest carnivores, the quality of forage may be superior enough in such habitat patches that Aptonoth are willing to risk it to keep feeding there, with small-scale changes to behaviour to try and reduce predation. The major competitors of the ancient forest may also impact Nagakuga in different ways. Whilst Rathalos may not say no to Carrion, upon spying Nagakuga out in the open, its primary target on approach may be Nagakuga itself, rather than its kill or whatever it's hunting. Rathalos is described as belligerent and hostile to intruders, and this includes Nagakuga. We see in Nagakuga's cutscene, it's the one initiating the attack. A healthy adult Nagakuga is a fair match for a Rathalos in a frontal fight, but we still see Rathalos has some undeniable advantages over it like flight and ranged fireballs that may make Rathalos the comparatively dominant competitor, 
as a volant animal, Rathalos can avoid Nagakuga much easier than vice versa, and the superior traversal of its territory means it can drop down at pretty much any time. The population also isn't just made up of healthy adults, and through this aerial policing of its territory, Rathalos may take a considerable toll of young animals from the population, and considerably reduce breeding success for the population overall. As well as constant harassment from Rathalos whenever it's out in the open, there's also Anjanath to contend with as well. Anjanath is belligerent and willing to take a shot at anything at least once, but may have its hands full trying to displace Nagakuga from a kill. But it may not have to to still impose considerable foraging costs. Anjanath in the ancient forest may fulfil a similar role to Espinas in that whilst it may not pose a large threat to Nagakuga itself, an incredible sense of smell and the fact Aptonoth are difficult to hide with their size mean that it struggles to hide its kills from Anjanath. What's more, Espinas is also a sluggish, sleepy animal, and likely has a comparatively low metabolic rate. The much more active Anjanath almost certainly burns more calories per day, and pound for pound needs a lot more food, that may make it an even worse thief of Nagakuga's kills and Rathalos' arrival may have also made this worse. Despite also suffering from Rathalos' aggression, Anjanath may have gained far more than they lost with the habitat changes it created in the ancient forest, also benefiting it greatly. Just as it suggested wolves subsidised bears by creating carrion in Yellowstone, Rathalos' arrival may have caused a large increase in Anjanath numbers in the forest too and making far more of them to steal Nagakuga's kills than prior. What may have once been a rare nuisance is now a borderline inevitability. Nagakuga's options to deal with this are limited, with the most obvious being to simply up their kill rates to compensate for the losses as some predators do. The guild's constant concerns over monsters ruining the ecosystem are likely unfounded, but to observers Nagakuga may seem to have a surprisingly high kill rate, solely to deal with kleptoparasitism. An increase in nocturnal activity may also help avoid Rathalos if nothing else. And much information on Nagakuga suggests this may be the case with it often being active at night. In the old world, breeding Rathalos and Nagakuga still share territory, chiefly in the humid wooded wetland areas. The two may still exhibit competition here, but it may be considerably less intense. This is likely about as open a habitat as Nagakuga will tolerate, and as closed a habitat as Rathalos will tolerate, and so lessened densities may mean lessened encounters. Plus, there's still considerable refugia here for Nagakuga to use. Old world Nagakuga's prey preferences also likely result in more smaller kills made in deep cover further reducing the risk of encounters. Similarly, the lack of another abundant competitor like Anjanath or Espinas may also further reduce costs to Nagakuga in such environments. So whilst not quite an armistice between the two species, environmental factors likely mean things aren't quite as intense as in the new world. So Nagakuga has a variety of competitors that likely impact it in different ways to affect its ecology. Rathalos serves as the wolf to Nagakuga's, well, Kuga, whose main goal is attacks of open hostility over actually taking the kills, though it may occasionally have these as a bonus. Espinas in the Old World and Anjanath in the New World may function in a bear-like role, not often posing a serious threat to Nagakuga, but imposing significant foraging costs due to kill theft, active usurpation in the case of Espinas, and passive scavenging for Anjanath although there will likely be some overlap there. Unlike its old world counterpart, New World Nagakuga likely doesn't have the option of focusing on more smaller prey, chiefly in part due to the fact the New World exhibits considerably fewer of the varied prey species old world individuals can readily predate. In the New World, its main solution may only be to adapt to the new normal, and up its kill rate to compensate for the losses caused by other predators. The unique paradise of the pre-Rathalos forest may now be forever prehistory, and the remaining denizens of the oxymoronic new ancient forest must adapt or join it to stay forever in the past. But there is more than one Nagakuga, and there are apparently several different colour morphs. Perhaps most common is the green Nagakuga, a lime-coloured individual often found in dense wetlands. 
if we were to compare Nagakuga to leopards here, then this may posit itself as a tempting opportunity for the old subspecies is actually the base species, but green Nagakuga in reality is a lot harder to figure out. Unlike leopards, Nagakuga has a much stricter habitat range, fundamentally preferring areas of dense cover. In melanistic leopards, it's suggested such habitats may lead to high rates of melanism, along with possible avoidance of tigers. So this doesn't really apply to Nagakuga. It's not like green Nagakuga live in open savannas, and regular black Nagakuga are the forest ones. It also seems unlikely to be algae in the fur-like sloths either, or black Nagakuga living in the same areas as their green cousins would likely become the same colour. So really, green Nagakuga may just be as simple as a different colour morph, and not a true subspecies. The dense vegetation of their preferred habitats combined with Nagakuga's activity patterns likely mean it doesn't suffer much detriment or advantage to its fitness for being a different colour. So green Nagakuga are mainly benign. Their comparative rarity may however suggest that it's a recessive gene. And indeed, all other colour morphs may be too. White and partially striped individuals have also been recorded, that are even rarer, and apparently blonde and blue morphs are rarer still, with seemingly no official records existing. All types of Nagakuga share perhaps their signature weapon, their long tail. As well as for balance, this may be Nagakuga's most frequent and useful weapon in trying to dispel other monsters. Like a porcupine, Nagakuga can rattle the loose spines at the tip, providing a clear auditory warning for aggressors. Similarly, the position Nagakuga raises it into uses body language as a pretty clear threat display as well. Nagakuga can also flick the quills like the urticating hairs of a tarantula, with surprising accuracy. And whilst this isn't likely to be fatal to large monsters, it will be painful, especially if it hits a sensitive area. In a melee struggle, the tail also presents itself as a good deterrent weapon, in that it allows physical engagement with the most distal part of the body to prevent risk of serious injury. Nagakuga also takes this a step further, by seemingly allowing the tail to stretch, apparently due to elastic cartilage. Other tissues aside, this would likely cause incredible nerve damage to regular tissues, so Nagakuga may have unique nerves. We see this in species like Rorcal whales, in their distensible cavum ventral that stretches to huge proportions in lunge feeding. The nerves are specialised to stretch over double their length by being highly folded when stored, and the tissue has copious amounts of flexible elastin and collagen in to promote stretching and reformation after the stretch, where the nerve tissue itself unfolds, with the collagen functioning as a check ligament to prevent overstretching. This is a truly bizarre adaptation, but one that allows Nagakuga to take full use of its signature weapon in the frequent competitive interactions that have shaped its ecology. To begin my thoughts on Nagakuga, I really do like him. In the top 20 for sure, but maybe not the top 10. I also don't believe Nagakuga is an anime edgelord monster. He may be ninja-like in appearance, but his primary design motifs come from melanistic leopards. I don't think it's fair to call him edgy due to his design when it's pretty close to what the animal is, so I don't think Narg is any more edgy than a leopard is. He's not super-powered or especially flashy, so certainly I don't think he belongs in the ranks with Magnamalo and Zenoga and so on. There are his eye trails, but this is apparently due to how fast he moves so I guess it's canon that the hunter has mild astigmatism. I think it's fine as a warning mechanism. It's a little stupid when hunting, but Ichinose only decided to implement this in Portable 3rd onwards, which is something I guess. I think Nagakuga visually nails a lot of aspects of leopards as well, but thinking more about this, I do detract the statement slightly. One of the most significant and interesting traits of leopards and cougars is their adaptability, and you can't truly be the leopard wyvern with Nagakuga's fairly strict habitat preference. So maybe Nagakuga embodies traits of populations of specific rainforest leopards over the whole species, which is still fine, and I'd much rather that than he be blighted with Tigrex's habit of appearing absolutely everywhere. Maybe that's also just me making it deeper than it is too. I think Silverwind sucks design-wise though. 
and this really was a missed opportunity to give Nagakuga some faded spots, like the ones you can see in melanistic big cats in some lights, or in certain melanistic individuals like Todoba's Black Leopard, much more interesting and fitting than Stripes, which Tigrex already uses. But onto his fight, and I think Nagakuga has fallen from grace perhaps more so than any other purely terrestrial monster. In Freedom Unite he was a great fight, fast and fierce and like the opposite side of the coin to Tigrex. Other than his tail slam, his attacks weren't hugely damaging, but they were fast and hard to dodge, and he gave few natural openings. He could easily accumulate damage on you quickly if you weren't careful, in contrast to Tigrex, who notably telegraphs his comparatively long, slow attacks, but punished you severely with the huge damage if you got caught by them. He was cautious of pitfall traps like Garuga, and flash bombs were near useless, as he'd leap around like Rajan. So when this was combined with speed, he felt like an interesting and original fight that was a class separate to others. More about technique and agility, rather than turn-based brute force like other Wyverns. And since Freedom Unite, it feels like he's got less interesting with each generation. Green Nagakuga is one of the better third-gen subspecies in lore, but one of the dullest in moveset changes, and then Silverwind just absorbs any difference it had in 4th gen. Nagakuga, however, reached his nadir in 5th gen with Worldborn and Sunbreak, made unnecessarily massive and now slow as a geriatric Labrador. Fighting him feels like fighting a bloated old circus lion rather than the agile panther of earlier generations. Gone are his speed and agility, and the additions to the moveset are okay at best. He retains his pitfall gimmick, but with the ease of 5th gen who felt like they really needed them anyway, when they were given things like the Clutch Claw and Wirebug to use instead, even in Master Rank. Also, for the love of god, give him Baryoth's running animation. There are a few things sadder than watching the Swift Wyvern crawl around like a lizard instead of bounding. I also think they could have put a few more cougar and big cat noises in over pig squeals too. As a caveat on Lucent Nagakuga, it shouldn't be much of a surprise that I don't really like him, but I almost think Lucent in a meta way is just the dumbing down of the themes of Nagakuga. Hiding 20 meters of Wyvern isn't easy, but through skill and stealth, Nagakuga achieves it. Lucent needs no skill as an ambush predator, it can just flick an invisibility switch. Nagakuga can metaphorically become invisible, but with Lucent it's literal. In the rush to make it epic and flashy, all they've done is make it a reduction. It's really just a less impressive feat for the animal, already in far better use with Camellios. But that said, in the earlier games, said themes were often weakly implemented, and can still often be, so it's not too hard to hit. Actually having the white individual is nice though. Overall, I'd like to see Nagakuga receive a significant revamp for his inevitable appearance in future games. Just making him half the size and twice as fast would be a good start. And one thing I really think Nagakuga can take from Baryoff is using his environment in the fight. Having Nagakuga flee and hide only to launch out of the dense foliage like a leopard ambush, maybe into a pin if you're not quick enough, and slash or have him drop out the trees too, and have him leap around much more on rocks and trees to set up or dodge attacks. Actually let him use his speed and stealth in denser, lower visibility maps, to let the player feel like the hunter is being hunted too. Some more environmental behaviours like him treeing kills would also be nice, as Nagakuga has always gelled well with atmospheric maps. Him sleeping in the trees of the Great Forest was a nice touch, and it was worth the Freedom Unite G-Rank slog to fight him in the old swamp, and see his eye trails in the dense fog. As main series games hopefully get deeper into more complex and atmospheric maps, one can only hope the monsters and their interactions with them are improved to match, and Nagakuga will always be a top candidate for fully embracing the camouflage, cover, and claustrophobia of a deep forest map. So despite my gripes with him as the series progresses, I still am and probably always will be very fond of Nagakuga. Thanks for watching. And a huge thanks to all patrons, but especially Erengar Steini, Phenomenon, Goggles ESM, K Sandom, Evi11Y, and Bazu Gazu Bakohatsu Bakomatsu. If you enjoy the content and can help out, 
a link to the Patreon is provided in the description, and any amount you can give is appreciated. Thanks once again to Carmen Rider Moten for their excellent images of monster behaviour. The ones you saw today were especially created for Nagakuga's video. Carmen is always coming up with great new pieces, as well as having a big catalogue of pre-made ones. So be sure to give them a follow on Mastodon, Tumblr, Reddit or DeviantArt for their art as it comes out. And thanks too to the Giza King who put forward the theory and paper for Nagakuga's nerves in its elastic tail as well. To address a few points from Val, you're indeed right to point out that Black Veil is a variant not a subspecies, which is a classic case of haha -ha whoops. Although that said, I don't think it's too big a thing as Capcom don't really seem to understand what a subspecies is anyway. And I still think Normal Val being the most recent one makes sense. Faris Karen also suggested regular Odogron may not use its full dragon element due to having to constantly deal with protecting itself from effluvium instead. Alana also brought up Yeti Crabs, an excellent potential analogue for Valhazak I missed, that feeds primarily on bacteria that it farms with its specialised chelicerae. Very Val indeed. And now here's the teaser for next week's video.